there is force pulling it in, but there's just a little bit more force pushing it out? Yes. Okay. But there's a lot, you're, you're really seeing the dominant force of centrifugal at that moment. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Those two terms, centra, centra. Yeah, centrifugal and centripetal. And so centrifugal is masculine, centripetal is feminine. Yin. Yin's inward, yang's outward. So it would have to be, it seems to my mind now, a stronger yin force that is keeping us on the surface of the planet, pushing us this way. Otherwise we'd be flying off. Well we're we're in the we're in the field of the yin energy. And so if you're on the inside, you're in the field of the yang energy. And so like what I was saying with the poi. There's, there's, um, tech, actually, there's centripetal spiraling all the way in and centrifugal spiraling all the way out. But there's much more centrifugal on the inner part and much more centripetal on the outer part. And so we are experiencing centrifugal force right now, but the dominant energy is centripetal. Once you go inwards, the dominant force is centrifugal. Yes? If on the water going down the drain, the centrifugal force is spinning it down, what's the uh, converse? Well, no, no, centripetal is spinning it down. Oh, okay. Yeah, these terms can get like flip flopped really easily, and so um, ideally we need to start, I feel like, moving to the terms of yin and yang. It's a little bit easier to use. Yes? Um, does the yin and yang, do they spin in um, opposite directions? Um, I'm going to say yes and no. Um, there, there's times where they, there's an the illusion, you could say, where they're spinning in the same direction. Um, but usually, yes, they're spinning in the opposite directions. So clockwise is that usually... Well, so, all right, I can, I can give you an example of why this can be confusing and how yin and yang can be applied to lots of aspects of the system. And so electricity is a yin force, magnetism is a masculine force. However, you could also say that the polarities with each of those has a yin and a yang also. And so that's where it can get confusing. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. Mm -hmm. And for those who are taking notes, I'd really recommend writing down this matrix. Um, it's something that would be really fun to explore and see all the patterns in it, and that it's a really, really dynamic um, little piece of number system. And so, could centrifugal and centrifugal be synonyms? Um, technically, they're the same thing; they're just pronounced differently. Right. So I was wondering if you use the term centrifugal, it would make a, a clearer audio distinction between those two terms while you're speaking. That is an excellent point. I'm just confused at the moment with making this matrice. Hold on one second. So the matrice I'm making represents the Star of David. And it's the matrix code behind the Star of David, understanding how the Star of David moves, how it dances with itself. Oh, I had it right. So this matrix is a six by six. It's one of the simplest matrices we work with in the math. Um, they can get much larger and much more complex. 
but this one relates to the Star of David. And I'll explain how to understand this, how to interpret this. And so, when I talked about having two linear sequences overlapping, which are made of nine numbers, and when you overlap them, it creates 18 numbers. And now there's two vectors in the sequence that can go both directions at the same time. And so, that 18 number sequence can be found right here. And A, B, C, so it would be X, Y, Z. So A connects to B, connects to C. X connects to Y, connects to Z. So what I mean by that is this sequence, this one, connects to here, and this one connects to here. Because there's 36 numbers in this sequence, there's two circuits of these 18 number sequences. And so, like I said, they're, they're interweaving. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Four, five, six, uh, seven, eight, nine, one, two, three. And there's two of these sequences um, moving in this system. Well, there's also in the vertical, there's the doubling sequence, one, two, four, eight, seven, five. The halving sequence, two, one, five, seven, eight, four. What we call is a trinity sequence. Um, three, three, nine, six, six, nine. And uh, a better way to understand it is, is starting at the three, three, nine, six, six, nine, three. Um, you sort of see the numbers still here. It's an oscillation going three, nine, six, six, nine, three. Um, a better way to understand that is this sequence relates to matter and antimatter. And so if you can imagine a, a spiral, spiraling out from one point and then spiraling back into another point. Um, there's, a, there's a name for this symbol. Does anyone remember it? Something like a, the, the spiraling out, it's an S spiral. Something like, like a Paisley? I think it's something like a Paisley curve. Um, and so if you have this, this S spiral, okay, think of one tip of this S spiraling in as a three and the other tip as a six. And the nine is the midpoint. And so there's, this is an interesting thing to think about is that there's almost four states of being. There, there's a state of the infinite being. And then in our reality, there's three different states to experience. There's the yin energy, the yang energy, and then the in-between, the stillness. Because when a state of infinite being is a state of infinite spin. And so the opposing energy to that is a state of complete stillness. And so if you're imagining the three as a white hole spiraling out, it then has it come to a point where there's no more energy of spin, and it starts to spin the other direction. That point, that stall point, is your point of stillness, which is nine. And it starts to spiral back in to a six black hole. That six black hole connects to a, a six white hole, and it starts spiraling out. And then it reaches uh, another nine, another point of stillness, and starts spiraling back in. And so this is a uh, abstract way to see us moving between matter and antimatter. There's always two polar states of this existing happening at the same time. And so how these sequences are made, these are also made by an interweaving mechanism. And so in the math, there's a, a trinity um, of family groups. And so I was talking about, these are still, you can still see them, three, nine, six, that's one family group. There's the two, the five, and the eight, and the uh, one, four, and seven. And so those three family groups is another level of relationship in the math. So I talked about the polar relationships, and then there's a trinity relationship between the numbers. And you start to see this fractalize out through the dimensions. How these sequences are made or by an interlacing of those family groups. So one, four, seven, two, eight, five. Uh, three, nine, six, three, six, nine. And so they're an interweaving of these um, patterns. The family group is interwoven through two of the f uh, three family groups, and the trinity is interwoven with itself. What you also get for information is the diagonal axes. And the diagonal axes in this one count by two, one, three, five, seven, nine, two, and then the diagonal axis right next to it counts the opposing direction, three, five, seven, nine, two. And so one way and then the other way. 
Um, so the difference between this and how it interprets something like this is there's two flows of energy side by side, one moving one way and one moving the other way. But before, um, with these interweaving sequences in the vertical and the horizontal, they're moving both ways, but they're overlapping. And so that's one way to see the numbers. But what does that mean? How do we actually apply this concept to have these flows interweaving in the same space and just being out of phase with each other? And then these two flows of energy that are slightly spaced apart and, and moving side by side. And so that's one of the troubles we've had is we see the math. It's the, the patterns are inherent. Um, they make perfect sense. How do we actually apply it to physics? And so Marco figured out this, this, this structure for the matrices. He came up with something called a rotating coil, which was a 12-point star. And I spent some time with Marco, and I couldn't get Marco to explain to me how do you create the interweaving of the information? How do you go from the matrix <laughs> to the coil? And uh, where's this coil? So this information is interweaving on this coil. And he couldn't explain how you create this interweaving structure. And that's something I eventually started to understand because how he was making these matrices is if you take a piece of paper, all right, say there's this matrice on it, you can take this matrice and wrap it around itself to form a cylinder. And if there's these two circuits, like this, they're connecting to this, it creates a double helix as it spirals around. And I'll explain this a little bit more. Um, and, but there was the notion of, as I was saying, A connecting to B connecting to C. And this concept allows an interweaving of the information. Before, he was just wrapping these matrices, and this point would connect to this point. And so you're really you're getting six circuits feeding into itself again and again. And so what I mean by that concept is if I folded this piece of paper with that idea, you just get rings going around this. And I don't want rings, I want helixes. And you can then take that helix and bend it around itself and connect it to itself to make the torus. But now you're probably wondering, how do you go from this nice smooth donut to this? And so this goes back to the idea of boundary layers. And that this information is just a boundary layer. And technically, it's just completely an abstraction. But what materializes from that abstraction is this. This is the internalized geometry of that boundary layer. But there's also an external geometry of flow of that boundary layer also, which we're not seeing. We're just seeing the interior form of it. And so I don't have one of my Star of David coils with me. But how to imagine a Star of David, um, how you make it, is you take two, pe two bars and twist them together uh, six times, and then bend it into itself. And that's how you see the simplest geometry of the Star of David. If you imagine, so there's a, there's a, a concept in, in, in physics that electrons like to move along the surface of a conductor. And I'm use the word electron even though it's a bad habit, which is when we start moving away from this term, that's a whole other discussion. Electrons like to move along the surface of a conductor. It relates to centrifugal force. And so, usually we make our wires out of cylinders. When you, do, when you make them out of a cylinder, the energy is distributed nice and evenly all around the cylinder. Now what happens if you texturize that wire, you put geometry into that wire, where it creates expansion and contraction of those fields. And that's what I'm doing right here. That's what you do with the double helix. And so the double helix, if you look at the double helix from a cutaway, all right, which is your figure eight, you'd have points of charge right here, and we'll call those negative charges, but then you also have a midpoint of information. And so when I talked about the contact idea is understanding the axis, is understanding the midpoint. And really what this map is, is it's a map of the midpoint, how everything revolves around an axis. And they're axes of twist, torque. And so if this is negative charged on the outer end, the center is going to be positively charged. However, the systems we're creating, we don't want that positive charge in the middle, like I was saying. We want a neutral charge. And so, there's a process where if you have two of these coils, this relates to the Sims 
double toroidal model. There's two ways to make these coils. Um, you can twist one way or they can twist the other. If you're looking at it from this side, you're like, oh, it's spiraling in uh, clockwise. Well, if I flip it over, it still looks like it's spiraling in clockwise. There's two different ways to make these coils. It, and if you have two of them and you overlay them, it relates to the system that the sim is talking about. However, what's more of the electrical phenomenon is, um, is if you polarize these coils. One of the coils becomes negatively charged, one becomes positively charged, then this oscillation, this structure, these could become negative on the outside, this becomes neutral on the inside. While the other coil is positive on the outside and neutral on the inside. And so what you're doing is you're creating structure of the energies within the actual conductor. Before, you just have a unit, you'd have the, the charges distributed nice and evenly around on the outside. But you don't want that. You want to create expansion and contraction. And then you can get into more complex ideas of this and how to create that expansion and contraction in very specific fractal geometries, such as to access a singularity. And so, In the coil, um, in, in this you have um, you have uh, expansion on the outside and contraction on the inside in a double helix. It's it, um, are you saying this is spinning in all directions? Um, they're they're spinning in opposite directions. And so let me let me explain more of this this idea right here. This is a cutaway of the double helix. And so, when I'm showing you this piece of information, this is first dimensional geometry. Or really, it's, <laughs> it's first dimensional topology. And so, you're looking at it, you're like, oh, there's circles, it's 2D. Again, we're just working with the lines. And so, in the, in the torus, the, the linear information is, is lines along the surface. And then the surface is composed out of those lines. And so every aspect of our reality, third dimension, you might be just observing the tetrahedron, but there's something creating the tetrahedron, and it's being created out of toruses. Those toruses are then being created out of um, uh, spherical forms of information. And so all the dimensions are integrated. They aren't separate. They're all playing and working together. And so this is just a cutaway, and I can, I can demonstrate this with Poi. And one of the other conversations we were, I was having with Nassim was the idea of parallel information. And he was saying parallel lines do not exist in the universe because the space is curved. And I was relaying that parallel, the term parallel and perpendicular are, are qualitative terms in math, not quantitative. And that um, to understand this term from a radial perspective instead of a linear perspective that the it, it's about the same the same direction of information maintaining the same vector and so if I'm spinning these poi right and if these poi have the exact same angular direction then they're parallel but as soon as I break off and do something different they're maintaining, maintaining different forms of information so you can almost say that parallel is um, things maintaining the same angular direction. So when I talk about uh, a cyclical information, it has to do with what direction you're pointing to. Zero degrees, 90 degrees, 180 degrees. When the information in the system has symmetry um, with, it, with another aspect, that's what parallel means. And so the helixes, the information is all parallel. And so in the, this is the, the octogram, there's three points of charge right here. On one end of this, there's three points of charge on the opposing end are three polar points of charge. And so, um, don't know where I was going with this. <laughs> um, oh, the three points of charge, they're all parallel to each other. Um, they're all spinning at the same um, angular direction. The only difference is they're out of phase with each other. Where it's going one, two, three, one, two, three. And so when I'm spinning poi, I'm gonna maintain the symmetry with the, with the Star of David. The Star of David um, has four focal points of energy. And so,
So in the Star of David, as this, each one of these circuits, each one of these lines, you could say, is constructed out of these 18 number sequences. But again, this is real, this isn't real. <laughs> and because this 18 number sequence represents one oscillation, you have one node here, and then one node here. And so it's dividing this geometry into two parts, two extremes. Well, the other geometry does the same thing, and it's just reflective of this one. And so, we have four points of focus. Now, if these two points are spinning around each other, going around the shape, just as these two. And so when I was talking about this is the personification, the embodiment, the doubling sequence, if you take the ratio from, oh, who's this guy? You take the ratio from the center of the Star of David, um, so the length from the center to this point, and then from the center to this point, that ratio is two to one. And so the ratio of this 2D form geometry relates to the doubling sequence. Well, in the octogram, the ratio from the center to the inside, from the center to the outside, the ratio in this guy is the square of the golden ratio. The octogram is the embodiment of the Fibonacci sequence in the golden ratio. And so the star of David and the octogram are just these sequences in geometry. And so to help you see this, I'm going to do this with Poi, really to do this exercise to fully see the energy moving around, um, I need a second person to do this with me. Um, and there's only another one friend who's... <laughs> it's, um, you're welcome to try if you have some boy. Um, uh, okay. Um, Can you use a hula hoop in your boy? No. You need another, another one. Well, that is the focal points. And these are the focal points of information. It's Heart where our awareness is. Heart and so when I, when I was talking about um, counting one through nine, this linear sequence, right? When I'm saying one, and then I'm saying two, my um, compression of awareness is on the two, and then my compression of awareness is on three, but my expansion is on the eight. And so this is one of the ideas of, um, of really using perspective or sentience in the math. It's like, well, how does the information create flow? I create flow. When I start perceiving the math and start counting it, I'm creating that compression right there and creating expansion on all the other information. So this is actually how you take the, senti the idea of sentience and apply it to the science. And so, yeah, I'll show you the motion. And so, it's doing uh, three rotations, spiraling them around each other, and to fully imagine this, there would be a second person behind me. We keep our backs face to each other doing this motion. And that motion is what we're replicating in the conductors. So we can do it with dance, we can do it with lots, we can apply it to lots of different things. But it's just understanding that compression of information moving in a specific kinetic geometry. So when I was talking about geometry, it's not static, it's all kinetic, all alive, all in motion. We usually just see the star of David as a symbol, but those two energies are spiraling around each other constantly in the star of David. Does anyone have any questions right now? Thank you. What's that last number in the circle on the very bottom? This one right here? Two? No, yeah, two. Okay. Mm -hmm. and, so, and so playing with this is seeing that every direction of information, there's a pattern. The whole thing is, is full of patterns. If you want to really explore and understand these matrices more, uh, Marco has a video online that he made, I think in Hilo, uh, about 10 years ago, going through the math. Um, and he just goes through all the patterns. He just keeps breaking down pattern after pattern after pattern. It goes on forever. <laughs> Vortex, uh, his presentation is in introduction to Vortex math. It could be vortex-based mathematics, it could be vortex mathematics. It's one of those terms. If you search Marco Rodin, M-A-R-K-O, Rodin, R-O-D-I-N, um, you'll pull it up. I had a question about the top diagram. Yes. I got the reflected. You said that's what is real, and the one through nine representation is not realistic. 
this. Right, so this is inherent within nature. This exists within consciousness. However, this is us taking our awareness and applying it to this um, to understand this. So this is just a language to understand, an artificial language to understand a natural language. Does that make sense? Yeah, so to clarify, the best not, the start date we have, best not representative of the numbers. Um, you'd say it's a higher evolution of the number circle. And so it's a number circle interweaving with itself. So would that be like one? I like, I like the three spiral nine six the black hole. Yeah. Would that be kind of representative of that? How you have the masculine going through that process coming out with the reverse kind of off of polarity coming mm -hmm. out? Yep. Yeah, you're welcome. Is it Alcatraz? Not familiar with it. Because there's an S6C, there's a substance, and then that's that nothing that made trace. Yeah, I'm not familiar with that. Sorry. Well, the reason why you're not familiar with it is because you're two completely different angles of the same thing. It's a different language. It's a language he hasn't assimilated. Is that, is that a traditional concept of mathematics? Yeah, so I'll, I'll fill you in quickly on my background um, in that I, uh, I, I excelled at math and physics as a child and went first in the state in Maine, I'm from Maine originally, you guys didn't know, Portland, Maine, um, for the Maine math meet and uh, was ne nationally recognized for some work in physics in high school. Um, but I dropped calculus like three times. I just, I couldn't do it, it just drove me insane. And, um, <laughs> And uh, the physics, some of the physics they were teaching me was like, oh, it's interesting, but there's something off with it. And so I, I self-taught myself from high school. Um, and uh, as soon as someone showed me Marco's video um, over three years ago, I was just like, click. All right, I'm leaving college. I'm, I'm doing this. And uh, it's, it's brought me places. Um, and so how I can uh, start to, anyone else have any questions? No, no, that, that makes sense. That makes a lot of sense. Um, it makes me think of when, I, when I've thought about the whole oscillating between matter and a matter and the polar universe and masculine and feminine. It makes me think of uh, the show Fringe. If you ever saw it, and it was interesting that they always had two universes co coinciding by each other at the same time. Um, it, it was interesting watching Fringe. Fringe is all about fringe science, which is what I do, and there's a lot of good stuff in it. They put a lot of real stuff onto that show. Um, and, and related to Hollywood, I'm not sure how this is going at the moment. Um, we're trying to work out a deal. There's uh, the writers of Heroes. Um, they want to use our stuff and have it come through the voice of a autistic boy who does math, who, who understands math and physics, on a show called Touch. Um, the first season's already done, um, but they want to start throwing in this stuff in the second season. We're trying to work out a deal with them where they're going to be giving us funding. <laughs> Thank you. And so it's really trying to get this stuff out in the mainstream and get people thinking about it and applying it. And how we can apply it. Um, well, my personal interest is applying to dance. I, I do fire dancing. And uh, how we can actually start to create macro size vortices. And so one of the exercises we're going to do, I'm not going to get into it yet, is we're going to create a vortex together. Um, and so, so the two things I'm passionate about, the three is I like teaching it, I like dancing with it, and then I like building with it. And so, explain what we're doing with this. Um, and so, how do we apply this to technology? So this is a piece of technology. Um, now I'm going to Ashland in a few days. I'm gonna be playing around and actually testing this with some, some equipment out there. Um, there's a team in Ashland um, some people have worked with Marco, some people have worked with the Sim, and uh, <laughs> what this
piece of geometry is, I like to call it a star coil. And it, so another problem with physics, to understand what I'm doing with this, is I'm unifying aspects of physics and math. And in physics, we have something called inductors and something called capacitors. We create inductors by spiraling wire to create magnetic field. Inductors are synonymous with magnetic field. Capacitors are synonymous with the electric field. That's taking, so when I hold my two hands up in the air, I'm creating a natural capacitor. The charge is building up, uh, the positive charge is building up in one hand, negative in another hand. The dielectric insulator is the air in between. As soon as I touch my hands together, that charge is, is distributed and starts spiraling around me. And so, in physics, we have capacitors, we have inductors, or right, in electronics. The thing is, you want to take those two ideas and you want to put them together. The magnetic does not exist without the electric, and the electric does not exist without the magnetic. And so, 